All right, well, God bless you guys. We're going to continue on today, part three of our series on Revelation. And what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to recap, obviously, what we've learned so far. Uh, and then we're going we're gonna to pass over chapter three, and I'll explain why we're going to move on to chapter four. So, so far, what we've learned, and we've spent, obviously, a lot of time already to, you know, basically three whole teachings in the first two chapters of Revelation. We've talked extensively about uh, the nature of the seven church letters. We also learned that I can't read um, because I kept pronouncing Thyatira wrong. Um, <laughs> obviously a little joke. But so we, we spent a lot of time in, in, in the first two chapters. We talked extensively, like I said, about the seven church letters, who they were written to, um, kind of the symbolic nature of them, and, you know, how Christ interacts with that group of people differently than he appears to interact with the church and what that tells us. So now, uh, for the sake of time, we're going to pass over chapter three. Not that there's anything, you know, un, or not that there is nothing noteworthy in chapter three, but it's the conclusion of the seven church letters. Like I said, for the sake of time and progressing through the book, we're going to move on to chapter four today. So just to recap and refocus a bit. So we're studying Revelation to further understand our hope and not to be surprised. And our hope is, I should say. Uh, from this teaching is that we're not going to be surprised of things that happen in the future. And we started out this whole thing when I taught on the Messianic Secret. Um, and if you haven't read it yet, if you go to truthortradition.com, I wrote a more full detailed article on that topic. If you haven't read it, if you'd like to, it's, not, it's uh, maybe three or four articles ago. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that topic. So feel free to check out that article. So it all started when one of the points of that teaching was we realized that Israel, you know, some of them may have been spiritually in tune, but they missed it on the Messiah, and they couldn't detect that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. So our hope, and but they could have, right, if they would have uh, closely, even more closely studied the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, perhaps they would have uh, realized it and uh, applied it in their lives. So that's what we're going to do through this teaching series. We're going to move through Revelation and hopefully overcome that same uh, problem that Israel did to some extent. Uh, obviously, there's going to be plenty of things we miss in the future timeline, but that's our goal, is to better understand um, the future so that we're not surprised. And we're going through this book from a futurist perspective. Um, you know, then this isn't anything new to you guys. The, you know, the STF teaching is that the book of Revelation is a futurist book. It's describing future events, and we're teaching that from a premillennial pre-tribulation rapture position. And we've talked a little bit about that already and we'll get more into it as the teaching goes on. You know, one of the most important points from the first session was that this book is very, very Jewish. It's very Hebrew in nature. And I'll keep reiterating this fact. The book of Revelation has over 200 Old Testament references. We're gonna see a lot of those today. Compared to the Gospel of Matthew, which most believe was written in Hebrew, the only gospel that was had 70 and the book of Hebrews has about 100. So it, so much Old Testament uh, is in this book, and that really shows us that the audience is, has a Hebrew nature. You know, we saw again last time that the seven church letters are likely a symbolic collection of encouragement, reproof, and correction for Christ follow or for a Christ following congregation after the rapture. And you know, another thing that I've been trying to reiterate throughout this whole series so far is that there are so many sections of this book. Um, revelation that can be directly applied to Christian living. And we're passing over one. It was mentioned in the first section, but we're passing over one. One of my favorite verses in all of Revelation is Revelation 3.16. Um, so feel free to go check that one out on your, on your spare time. So, and then obviously, this is the most disagreed upon book in the entire Bible. So my goal is I'm going to teach it to you the best that I can, the best that I know. And please know that I understand that I am wrong. There's plenty of things that I'm going to be teaching you that are incorrect, um, but I'm just doing my best. And so do your best to do your study on your own. Confirm what I believe or come up with your own beliefs. But I'm going to teach it to you the best that I can. So that's a little recap. So today our goal is to move on through chapter four. And what chapter four is, we're going to get a good look into God's divine counsel. We're going to see, like I said earlier, a ton of Old Testament uh, references. And at the end of this teaching, my goal is that uh, what we actually get from it is an encouragement to worship God for who he truly is, that is the divine king of our universe and our earth. 
So let's just jump right in. If you have your Bible, we'll go to Revelation chapter 4. And I'm going to be referencing a lot of Old Testament passages. Many of them are in Exodus. Um, if you would like to, you can uh, turn your Bibles there, but I'm going to be referencing them pretty quick. But we'll be in Revelation 4. We're going to make it through the whole chapter today, I hope. So, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After these things, which would be the revelation of the seven church letters, after these things I saw and look, a door had been opened up in heaven, and the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you the things that must come to pass after this. So, who's talking here? Well, we go back to Revelation chapter 1. Jesus is identified as, or as the voice speaking to me like a trumpet. So we've got Jesus talking to John again, and it's almost as if there was a gap in between these two events, you know, the way it's worded. After these things I saw, um, and look, a door had been opened up in heaven, and then in verse 2, it says, John says, immediately I was in the spirit, and look, a throne was set in heaven, and someone sitting on the throne. So it's almost like there was a gap, because um, he was in the spirit in the first three chapters, and then again, he was immediately in the spirit. Not sure what that necessarily means, but what we do know is that now, after the seven church letters were revealed to John, he's getting another vision of something else. And uh, the way that Revelation is written, it, it was after he received the seven church letters. So in verse two, which we already read, you know, like again, John was in the spirit. He was in a spiritually enabled trance. I don't know how else to word it. He, you know, he was. Um, I've never had one of these. I, I've talked to people who have. But he was almost like out, an out-of-body experience. And John saw, um, I want to say, quote, someone's throne, which we find out is God's throne. And if you read this verse in the Greek, and you'll see this in your Bible, um, the word someone or one is italicized. The way that it reads in Greek is um, like upon the throne sitting. So it's, it, it's an interesting uh, phrase in Greek, but we're, what we're going to find out is that this is God's throne. And we start to figure that out in the next verse. So verse 3, And the one sitting was in appearance like a jasper stone and a carnelian. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And immediately, hopefully for you, you're starting to already get Old Testament imagery in your mind. Um, like our, our Old Testament reference spidey senses should be tingling. You know, there's a lot that can be said of, about stones in the Old Testament. And what I would like to suggest is that these two stones are chosen for a particular purpose in the, Re the Revelation text. So as you know, throughout history and throughout different cultures, stones have different names. So identifying exactly what stone we're talking about in the Bible can be quite difficult. You know, in the in the or the REV, the Revised English Version text, we see the, the stones called Jasper and Carnelian. Um, in Greek, the stone Carnelian is called Sardius. But regardless of what their names are, what we know about these is that they are two red gemstones. Um, Jasper being a red gemstone and Sardius or Carnelian being like an orangish red gemstone. And this should make us look back to the Old Testament and think about where gemstones appear. And if you go back to Exodus 28, where God is telling Moses how to set up the priestly garments, um, the ephod or the breastplate that God tells Moses to make, if you read it in translations like the ESV, you'll see that the first stone listed is a sardius and that the last stone listed is a jasper. The same two stones that are uh, shown here in um, Revelation chapter 4. And it's interesting that it's the first stone and the last stone. And what I think this means is that it's, it's pointing out that the, uh, like it's the fullness. If I, if I give you a list and I give you the first and the last, I could be using a figure of speech to say that it's all, right? I am the alpha and the omega. I'm not just the beginning and the end. I'm also everything in between. So it's the same thing here. So God is pointing out, or I should say Jesus is pointing out to John that the appearance of the person that's sitting on the throne is encompassing all of these same stones that are on the ephod. So the point here has actually nothing to do with the particular stones, but what is being represented by the two stones we see here, uh, chapter 4, verse 3. The first and the last stone of the ephod are used essentially as a description of God 
And this makes sense. The whole point of the tabernacle, the whole point of the temple, and even the priests is to uh, resemble God and serve as a footstool uh, uh, for God's interaction on earth, right? This is like where God's interaction between heaven and earth meet was in the temple and through the priestly garments and through the ornate items of the temple. So those, that's what I think the gemstones are pointing out. It's just another allusion to the Old Testament way of priestly living, uh, priestly service, and the interaction between God and earth. That things in heaven were, or I should say, that things in the earthly temple and tabernacle and priests were modeling the things in heaven. Because right now we're looking in God's throne room. So apparently God's throne room, very similar to what we see in the tabernacle and in the temple. So also we saw the reference to the rainbow. And you know, it's not necessarily the exact same type of rainbow of the, of the flood, but what we see here are very, very bright colors, and that should make us think of the Old Testament, too. So we've got, well, you know, what were the colors of the tabernacle and the temple? They were blue and red and purple and gold, very bright, ornamental colors, and we see in God's throne room the same thing. We've got bright gemstones. His throne is made of, of uh, emerald. You know, the, the colors of the rainbow are there. So very, very beautiful, very, very colorful. So uh, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, verse 28, you'll see the same thing that, um, you know, God has a lot of colors in his throne room and that his throne is made of emerald and that there's a rainbow. So that's verse 3. Verse 4. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and on their heads were crowns of gold. And there's tons of discussion around this verse. You know, who are these elders? Um, considering that we're reading from a futurist perspective of the book of Revelation, what I'll be explaining is that these are spiritual leaders. These aren't, um, these aren't humans. There's a lot of people who will teach that these are human beings, that perhaps they are uh, Old Testament heroes, perhaps they are uh, Christian heroes, like uh, perhaps they're um, the apostles and the like. But we'll be, I'll be explaining that these are spiritual beings. So and not humans. So I have three discussion points that I want to elaborate on. And if you would like, you can go to the REV and, and read the full commentary that John wrote for this. I'm going to point out a couple things that, um, at least one thing that wasn't mentioned in that commentary that I think is a, a good point. And it builds off of what we saw in verse three. So the first point is if we believe that the book of Revelation is written um, such that the end times events are mostly in chronological order, which I believe is true, that they are mostly in chronological order, then the resurrection hasn't happened yet. And so these can't be, the, I should say, the resurrection of the righteous, or the, res, the first resurrection hasn't happened yet. So these can't be Old Testament great heroes. And then if you go to Revelation chapter five, which we'll get there next time, the elders say that Christ redeemed people and he made them a kingdom of priests to God. So if the elders were Christians, why would they have excluded themselves from the group? Why would they identify the other Christians as them and not us, right? If they were Christians, they would say, um, he made us a kingdom of priests to God. They would have grouped themselves in on this statement. And the third point, which you won't find this in the REV commentary, is that the number 24 is also an Old Testament reference is regarding elders. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, it's recorded that there are 24 divisions of the Levitical priests. So there's 24 elders in God's throne room, and it was set up since there were 24 elders of the priesthood. So like we've already described in the last verse, God set up things on earth, apparently, as he did in heaven. So that's verse four. Again, you can go on to the RAD uh, and read a little more full commentary on that. Those are just three of the main points I wanted to make regarding that verse. So uh, verse five. And out from the throne was coming lightning and rumbling thunder. And in front of the throne, there were seven lamps of fire burning, which are the seven spirits of God. So uh, hopefully your Old Testament spidey senses are still tingling, right? Anywhere God went in the Old Testament, there was thunder and there was lightning. You know, God appeared to Moses and the Israelites on Mount Sinai in a, in a cloud of thunder and lightning, and it was big and booming. So we know that we're looking at God's throne. And what are the seven lamps? in front of God's throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You know, this should also be making us think of the Old Testament. 
you know, um, in Exodus, again, in Exodus chapter 25, God tells Moses how to make the tabernacle. And there's supposed to be seven lamps in the holy place outside of the holy of holies. These were supposed to provide light in a place that was otherwise totally dark, right? We've talked a lot about the tabernacle in our fellowship. And now the inside, there weren't, if it weren't for the lamps, it would be a totally dark place because there's these thick cloths <coughs> that make up this big tent for priestly service. So these seven uh, lamps, you know, seven sources of light, which are the seven spirits of God are represented on earth by the seven lamps in, uh, in the tabernacle. So again, we're seeing that God set up the things on earth as he did in heaven. All right, verse six. And in front of the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And on every side of the throne, uh, even around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And again, <laughs> Old Testament. So uh, what I will do really quick is I want to give credit to Dustin Smith because he um, explained this one to me in a way that I could not see on my own. So what is this sea of glass like crystal so if you go into first kings this didn't appear in the tabernacle but it appeared in, in solomon's temple he, we see in first kings that solomon made a quote-unquote sea in front of the temple for ceremonial bathing and sir i should say ceremonial washing of hands and it held two thousand baths of water and it was made out of steel he basically made this big uh, bird bath but it was a, a gigantic um I don't know how else to describe it other than like a little foot pool in front of the temple that hold, held a ton of water. And, you know, we know that Solomon made everything of the temple to, to God's description. So again, we see God setting up the things on earth as he had in, in heaven, because now in heaven, there's this gigantic sea of water. Uh, I would say it is of water because it looked like glass and it looked like crystal. And it doesn't take us very long to realize that that could be a description of water because we go out to a nice pristine pond or lake in the morning and there's no wind and it's perfectly calm and you we use the expression the water looked like glass <laughs> so again that's first kings chapter 7 verse 24 where we see that solomon made a sea in front of the temple and that that is reflected in god's throne room so verse 7 and the first creature was like a lion and the second creature like a calf and the third creature had the face of a man and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle and these are odd creatures obviously you know why does god have these creatures in his throne room but if we go to ezekiel and we start going to chapter one of ezekiel we get another image of god's throne room and what does ezekiel see he sees four creatures that each had four heads and he describes the four creatures um, each one had the head of a lion each one had the head of an ox or a calf each one had a head of a man, and each one had a head of an eagle. So we see continuity between Ezekiel's description of the, of the, of the throne room and of the Revelation uh, explanation of the throne room. You know, all of this, if you're an Old Testament reader and, and you've uh, got a good background, and all of this should be speaking to you. It's actually, if you look at it, it's not a perfect match, these two descriptions of these, of these creatures, but obviously they're somewhat symbolic. Regardless, um, we see much continuity between these two descriptions. And if you're, again, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, this should just be lighting up to you that God's throne room uh, has been reflected on earth through the tabernacle. You know, and you have the, the cherubim and you've got the creatures that are depicted in the tabernacle and, and with gold leaf. God set up the things on earth, the temple, the tabernacle, and the priesthood like they are in heaven. Okay, so verse 8, and we'll conclude, we won't stop, we'll read the last four verses uh, as a conclusion to this teaching. It says, and the four living creatures, each one of them had six wings, are full of eyes uh, around and within, and day and night they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and throw their crowns before him saying, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power for you created all things and because of your will, they exist and were created. So this is chapter four. And the reason I wanted to just 
move on to those last four verses is because I think that these are the ones that have a very practical application for us. And I thought they were better read together. Um, you know, we should be, there, there should be much of us that is uh, in the same mindset as these creatures that are in the throne room and these elders that are in the throne room of God. You know, the last verse, you are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and the power for you created all things. And because of your will, they, uh, they exist and were created. Now, that is a, a great prayer of praise to God. And, you know, Tim, you know, one of the ways that you usually end your prayers, or I shouldn't say usually, but sometimes is that, God, you are the true great God, King of the universe. And that's so true. And that's a great prayer because you know, there's so many gods that we can uh, become slaves to in this life, but there's only one true God. There's only true one God King of the universe. And we see in God's throne room that there are these beings, these creatures, these elders that are in constant prayer and supplication and praise to God. And the whole point of this chapter was to look into God's throne room and see that God set up things on earth as they were in heaven. And then it ends with this explanation that these beings that were in God's throne room are constantly in praise of him. And that should encourage us and remind us that if God set up the things on earth as he did in heaven, then the beings on earth should be in constant prayer and praise and honor and glory, giving that honor and glory to God. So that's why I think that these last four verses, you know, we should never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We should, we should always have that on our lips. We should always have it in our hearts and on our minds, right? When you go to the greatest commandment, Deuteronomy 6, 4, you know, we're supposed to love our God with all our heart, with all our soul and all our strength. And Jesus points out that that's one of the, one of the two greatest commandments that upon you can hang the whole, whole law. You know, this is how he did that. Always on his lips, always on his mind, always on his heart was the fact that God deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the power because he truly is, like, um, like you would say, Tim, he is the true God King of the universe. So I hope that um, your understanding of Revelation chapter four is more clear. You know, it's not, a, it's not a huge chapter as far as doctrine, but we see a lot of Old Testament references, some very cool imagery of the throne room, and that's gonna continue a little bit in chapter five. But I also hope these, that these last four verses uh, provide us good direction as how we're supposed to, to live as Christians, how God wants his people to live. Um, so again, that was the whole point of this teaching and we'll continue on in chapter five next time. Amen. Yeah.